I think we've started. I just want to say hi to everyone. And there's two Kenyans involved, me and Nice, and we're only two minutes late. So I think we're winning. Um, we're going to try and connect with Nice because she's having some issues connecting to the webinar. While she does connect, um, I'll just introduce myself a bit. My name is Kimberly Leonard. Um, I'm originally from Kenya. I don't know how much you know about me. I'm originally from Kenya, but at the moment I work for Sky News. I'm an anchor in London. Um, and I grew up in Nairobi and I have a long standing relationship with Amref because I have obviously growing up there in Kenya, Amref is part of our lives. And recently, because of the pandemic, I've done quite a bit of work with um, Dr. Githinji Gitahi, who is the head of Amref in, well, the head of Amref. Um, a lot of stuff about the uh, COVID, the pandemic, and most recently about um, vaccines and vaccine equity. So we are still trying to get nice up. Let me see what's going on. I'm chatting to them on WhatsApp. Um, yeah. But we are hoping to get her up. Is she coming? Until then, you get to chat to me. I'll tell you Thank a bit you, more. Thank you, Kimberly. I'm here. Thank oh, you. Oh, nice. You've joined us. Hi. You're on mute, nice. Yeah, thank you. So, oh. you know, I'm in the village. That's why I'm <laughs> having trouble with connections, but it's fine. I think now I'm good to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you, Nice? I'm in Loitok Tok, that southern part of Kenya. That's where I come from. Oh, oh I should do a video, right? Okay. Yeah, if you can. Oh, there. How fantastic. I'm in rainy, rainy London, and you're in Loitok Tok. How yes. fantastic is that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, nice. Um, I was just introducing you and just saying really um, who I am, but let's talk about you. You you grew up, as you say there in Lotokitok, you're um, a, an award-winning human rights activist and you've written this fantastic book. I've been delivered a copy, The Girls in the Wild Fig Tree. Um, and it's basically about how you escaped FGM, the cut. I wanted yeah. to start, nice, if you could just start, let's, let's begin this evening. I've got my chai, I'm here with my shuka. <laughs> let's start with a reading, if you don't mind, right from the beginning. And I think it, it really sets up who you are and, um, and where you grew up, where you were born. And um, yeah, it sets it up nicely. Shall we begin with that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Kimberly, uh, for the great introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this. We truly appreciate uh, all of you for making time. So I think I will start with that chapter, and that's page six uh, to eight. And uh, the title is A Maasai Girl. <clears throat> I grew up in Nomayanat, uh, a Maasai village near the town of Kimana, close to the border of Kenya and Tanzania. It is in an area of plains where elephants, wild beasts, uh, and giraffes graze on grass and occasionally spindly trim. Baboons and velvet monkeys will sneak into human homes to steal sugar or honey. Like us, they also have sweet tooths. Where water runs, plants are thicker and animals gather to drink and hunt one another, Mount Kilimanjaro looms. The sunlight glints pink off its icy summit. My town was small then, though it has since grown much larger. It was just a, a couple of streets of simple one and two uh, stories in the block buildings. Perhaps five thousands of people lived in, in the town. Though many of these, uh, my family included, lives in homes far from the city center. The Maasai own, own cows, sheep, and goats, so we need plenty of space for our animals to graze. In the center of town, there was Rikari Market, sorry, Rikati Market. And on Tuesdays, people walk from miles away to display and 
are upturned uh, crates. They are fleshly slaughtered goat and lamb, tomatoes from uh, tomatoes and onions from their small gardens, and handmade traditional clothes. Back then, the route from Nairobi was unpaved, so you need a strong backside or ride or ride or ride the washboarded road. When tourists came, they usually they usually arrived on small airstrips and bypassed our town entirely. The locals got around on motorbikes on their feet. Group of Maasai women would cross the plains carrying loads of water or firewood. Maasai men, their bright sugar spot of color against fading paint and uh, dusty plants gathered on, gathered on, uh, sorry. Sorry, just a minute, I think I... So I'll repeat there. Groups of Maasai women would cross the plains carrying loads of water or firewood. Maasai men, their bright sugars, uh, sports of color uh, ag against fading paint and uh, dusty plants gathered on corners or under trees. It is a dry place and everywhere there is dust. Great, great funnel like clouds of of it move through the plains, the animals and people walk past hardly noticing. The Maasai have lived in the area for centuries, and like some of our neighbors, we were hunted. We raised cows and goats and lived off their meat and milk. These are still our favorite food. We ate every few vegetables or plants. One of my uncles, brags that he has never tasted chicken. <laughs> families, families lived close together in a mixture of traditional hand-built structures and more modern concrete block, uh, blocked homes. Traditional homes are circular structures coated with a mixture of dung and mud. Two small beds made uh, of stretched uh, cowhide. One of the parents, uh, one of the children, <coughs> are only are, are are the only furniture. The homes are quite small and dark, little more than shelter during the night. Most of our time was spent outside. In our in our towns, someone you know was always in the earshot and children ran in and out of one another's house, not bothering to knock. I made friends easily. I still assume I will like every person I meet. And there was always a friendly face. It is still my home, though there are more buildings, more people, and definitely more cars than when I was a child. I have I have traveled around the world, but this area, these people call to me in a way no one, no other place can. I love our traditions, the bright cloth of the shukas we wear, the many voices, each singing in slightly different tune, blending in a rich, uh, in a rich harmony in our music, the generous spirit with which we share with our families and neighbors. But I want to change much about our lives, the poverty, the lack of education, and most of all, the position of women. Change does not mean giving up what is good in ourselves. It means keeping what is the best while accepting the need to grow. We can herd cattle while carrying cell phones. We can wear traditional clothes, some days and pantsuits on others. We can eat our simple meals of meat and milk and also enjoy a spicy chicken vindaloo or a cool, fresh 
cucumber salad. We can maintain strong family bonds while our women get education and bring money into the family. I am Masai, I am part of the community and it is part of me. My life began here and so did my mission. That was, that was beautiful, um, nice, thank you so much. Let's, we'll talk about your mission in a bit, but I just want to um, say that we will have a Q&A session at the end of about 20 minutes before we end. And if you want to ask any questions, just put them in the box um, and they'll get sent to me and I'll ask nice on your behalf. And also if you want to put anything on social media, just use the, use the hashtag wild fig tree. Also the session is being recorded. Um, Okay, nice. Let's talk about what happens to Maasai girls, because FGM is a big part of the community, a big part of what happens to them, isn't it? It's a huge part of their early childhood. Um, if you could just explain what FGM is for people who don't know, and how it is a part of um, Maasai culture. Uh... I will probably first speak about the Maasai community because that's where I come from. Uh, because remember each community or each tribe across Africa or Kenya has its own reasons and needs behind female genital mutilation. Uh, if you probably sit down because I've been to other places where my Ambref is also working on the FGM issue, like probably Senegal or Ethiopia, you might find it's either, you know, because more, most of the people are Muslim, it might be hygiene or purity. Uh, so it depends with the community. So coming to the Maasai community, where I come from, it is a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. So this is what makes you a woman. So if you have not undergone the cut, it means as much as I, you know, no matter how, you know, how many years you have, even if you're 40 or 50, they don't consider you a woman uh, because you have not undergone the cut. And the reason they do it, it's a rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. And if you have undergone circumcision, remember they have already prepared you to be someone's wife. And if you're expected to be married off, it means there's no school for you. It also means uh, you'll, uh, you, you, you know, you'll have children while you're still a child. Because remember, it's done to girls who are from the age of uh, eight to 14 or maybe 13, because sometimes they also look at your physical appearance. Uh, so if it means if you're taller, you'll go earlier. If you're shorter, maybe that's when you'll take time, maybe when you're 12 or 13. And uh, also the only other reason why they do it is because they want you to be accepted by the community because every girl, every woman in that community has undergone circumcision. So if you don't undergo, it means you're not accepted as a woman. And it's also like... Um, you know, it's, it's shameful to your family. So that's why parents would want their daughters to undergo it so that you're also accepted. And it also means if you have not undergone the cut, there is no man from that community is going to marry you. So they want you to be married off. So uh, I always like putting it in simple, like uh, female genital mutilation is not just a physical cut. It's a cut of human rights because it, like in Kenya, we have the 2011 Prohibition Act against female genital mutilation. And in most countries around Africa, we also have laws against female genital mutilation. But uh, you know, it's a cultural issue we, we all accept. So it means there is no school for you. It means you're becoming a mother while you're still a child. It means also, uh, 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 you know, you cannot even choose whom and when to marry because it's the family that uh, chooses, you know, the kind of person who is going to marry you. So, and uh, that is why you've seen in communities where we are coming from, uh, if you go to schools, you don't find girls in schools. You can find, you'll find them in school when they're at the younger age, like under nine years, under eight years. But after that, because that's the period when FGM happens, that is now where, uh, uh, you know, they leave school and they get married and they become mothers. And you see, looking at also my story, I remember even me when I was a young girl, I witnessed marriage ceremonies. I saw my friends when they are going to uh, female genital mutilation. I saw death out of it. I saw them leaving school and becoming mothers while they're still children. So it's not like things I'm reading on books, but it's the things that I've seen like my friend, my neighbors, my family members undergoing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. tell us, when did you realize 
what it was and what was going to happen to you? And then when did you realize that this was not something that you were going to accept? And how did you manage to avoid being mutilated? Uh, I realized uh, when I was still young that it is not something for me. And I said it's because, uh, you know, before I lost my mother, because I lost my parents at the age of, you know, seven and six, because it was a span of, uh, you know, one year. And uh, every morning, my mother would wake me up together with my sister to go and witness the cut. Because the, your family has to prepare you. There are things when you're undergoing the cut that you're not supposed to do. One of them is crying or moving your body or moving your eyes. It means, you know, you know, they call you a coward or there's no man from that community who is going to marry you. And that is why your mother will take you to go and witness other girls just to make sure that when your times comes, you're strong. You're, you will not come and cry or in, you must, know, run away to a That must have been family. horrific. That must have been absolutely horrific as a six or seven year old. You're yeah. watching girls being mutilated. It is. It's not easy because you see you are young, you're a child. Yes, they say it's normal in culture and all that. But yeah, I will say it's not easy because after attending these ceremonies, it's also when I knew that this is not something I wanted to undergo. Uh, when I talk of death, I've seen because of the ceremonies I've undergone when girls have undergoing the cut. Remember the same girls I was going to see? I was either with them in school. They are my neighbors. They are my family members. And, uh, you know, at some point you are with them before circumcision in school, but after circumcision, they are not coming back. As much as they are 10 years, they are 12 years, they are considered women and they are married off. And, you know, that's something I started saying, I don't want to leave school. And the only way I'm able to continue with my education is when I don't agree to undergo the cut because I'll be married off, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't be, or even I'll die. And uh, it was not easy. And uh, yeah, I think out, out of that, and also really, because as I said, I, I like talking. So I'll hear about one thing I hear, because remember also your family will try and tell you how important FGM is, how important it is for you to be considered a woman and all that. And I think also, uh, sometimes I could go to school, I could talk about it, I could ask, is it true, will I die if I, undergo, if I don't undergo circumcision? They will tell you, not, you will die if you don't do it, you will not be able to have children. They like scaring you because, you know, they, they feel like that, you know, you will bring shame to their family. So they will try and use all means and make sure that you are, you, you know, you are, you are, you are ready for it. So, so what was it that made you able to not undergo it? Um, because your time came, didn't it? Yeah. Your time yeah, came. yeah. So just talk us through that day and what, yeah. what, what you were thinking, what you were feeling and how you managed to escape. Uh, so after losing my parents, I went and lived with my grandfather. And uh, that's when I got a chance to go to a boarding school. And you see in a boarding school, you also interact with girls from different schools. And um, you know, earlier on I've been trying to convince my family, but they didn't agree. So our day came and you know, my circumcision together with my sister and my three cousins was planned. And we were supposed to wake up at 4 a.m. and you shower with cold water. As I told you, there are things you're not supposed to do when you're uh, undergoing the cut. And that's why they give you, you shower with cold water that has slept outside for two days. And that water is supposed to act as anesthesia. And, uh, you know, how I old? remember when- How old were you? I think I was eight around that time when I was supposed to undergo the cut here, yeah, about eight, eight and a half about there. And uh, remember, as I said, I've seen girls, I've seen death and all that. And also, I think what was an eye opener to me was the boarding school that I went because I was I had girls not only from my community, but girls from different communities. And I'll, I'll ask my teacher, I'll ask my my girls, you know, what, what, what do you think they want to do it? They're like, no, it's not happening in our community. And also remember in school, we used to shower in big bathrooms together. 
And uh, the girls from other tribes were wondering, why is FGM done to our girls? And they would look at them, laugh at them and all that, which was not good. So I was like, if I undergo also and I come back to school, I don't think I'll have a, a, a friendly environment. And why they are doing it is because also they don't understand why it's done. You know, that time people will not, you know, the sensitization on, on uh, about FGM was, wasn't raised and all that. But I think it was more why I decided not to undergo it is just because I wanted to go back to school. And in future, I also wanted to come back and, you know, help my community and support that community. Could you envisage a community um, or yeah, your community being one in which in your lifetime, women weren't mutilated in this way? Sorry? Could you imagine as an eight-year-old um, that you could bring about so much change that they wouldn't be practicing FGM in your village? Yeah, uh, when I started it, uh, of course, I was not thinking of, you know, doing what I'm doing now and, you know, getting all those recognitions and all that. When I started it, I just started to help my small village, you know, to help my small community. And uh, the reason was um, also, I think in the story, you will see that uh, my sister was not able to run away with me the second time. She agreed to undergo the cut and uh, she was married off at a very early age. I couldn't help her, but I was telling myself, uh, one, she has sacrificed herself so that I have a chance to go to school. But secondly, I couldn't do it for her, but it doesn't mean I have to keep quiet. I have other sisters all over Kenya, all over the world, all over Africa, because it's not a Kenyan issue. You know, FGM is a global issue. And that's when I started telling myself, one, running away as I ran away is not a solution. We have girls with this ability who are blind who cannot walk where will they run to and remember also it's not a solution I don't have a place to keep them I kept on fighting with the community because first I thought like helping them to run away was a solution and later on is also when I felt like it's important to engage our people because this is what culture says that's what they believe in but by talking to them by having dialogue and raising awareness I think we are able to to make change and um Yes, back to your question. I wasn't mm. thinking of really going everywhere and help, but I just wanted to help. I couldn't do it for my classmates. I couldn't do it for my friends, for my family members. But I said it's high time because I was also saved. Someone did it for me. I also need to give back to the society. I need to start a conversation with our people. I need to make change because every girl deserves an opportunity to an education. And every girl deserves to be the woman of our dreams. And, you know, that's how it started. Um, let's go back to that that day. You're eight years old. You're woken up at four o'clock in the morning and you're told to shower in this water that's been outside for two days. So that was the first time. What happened then? So after showering with the cold water at 4 a.m., uh, the circumciser was there and, you know, a group of men were there. And, uh, you know, I had conversation the previous night and even all along we've been talking. I was talking to my sister and I've been telling her I am not ready for it. I don't want to die. I don't want to leave school. I don't want to become a mother while I'm still a child. I don't want to be someone's wife. I don't want to start cooking for someone, you know, doing the heavy duties that, you know, uh, you know, an, Af an African woman or a woman from this village is supposed to be. So that is not what I wanted. And uh, even her, she was like, yeah, even me, I want to go on with the education. So, um, so when we woke up uh, that morning, we had already uh, planned on how we were going to escape. So we woke up, showered with the cold water, and we went outside our uncle's homestead. And there was a tree that was there. We climbed the tree, and then uh, we stayed there. So when even the circumciser was coming and a group of men, we could see them. But it was late at night. We have wild animals. We couldn't go anywhere. We had to wait until when there was light. When there was light, we walked down. Uh, to our auntie's place, which was more than 10 kilometers. And when we were there after a week, uh, you know, a group of men and my uncle came there because they realized we escaped to our auntie's place. We were beaten so you, and you ran, you ran to your, to your aunt's place? Yeah. So we and were, then they came and got you again? Yeah. So uh, when we were beaten and threatened, uh, we had to promise that we'll not run away. So we went back to school. Schools were closed again. It was planned for us again. And that's when the second time when my sister said, I can't be running away every time. Maybe because you're younger than me, if I agree to undergo the cut, they will allow you to go to school. So 
yeah, that's how it started. And later on, after also realizing that it's not a solution, I needed to talk to my grand grandfather. I kept on postponing my circumcision time, saying I'm still young, I don't want to die, I don't want this, until one day I decided to have that conversation with him. Okay. Um, I just want to go back to your book. Why is it called The Girls in the Wild Fig Tree? Nice. It's called The Girls in the Wild Fig Tree because it's that tree that saved my life. It's uh, that tree that really I was able to get an education. It's that tree that now I'm doing it for other girls, you know, all over the world, like to talk to them, to give them hope and tell them, because I'm not saying I'm the only one who has undergone, uh, you know, this kind of challenge. I'm sure there are many other girls who are, who are there and women who have undergone even probably difficult situations more than me. So one is also just to give them hope and uh, that why, why, why girls in the wild fig tree is because it's the tree, I'll put it in word, word, one word, it's the tree that saved my life. How, how did it save your life? As I was telling you before, the first time I ran, I, I had to hide myself in that tree. If the tree was not there, I don't know what would have happened to me. Maybe I didn't have any other place because remember I climbed the tree. And you know, a tree has different branches. So when you stay up there, you are not seen. So that's how I stayed. The second time when I ran, I still went to the same tree because my sister told me I will not tell anyone uh, and no one knew that the other time that's where we were hiding. So the second time I still went to that tree, hid there. And that's when now I decided to go back, not to my mother's uh, sister place, but to my teacher, that is teacher Caroline. So uh, yeah, it's the one that saved my life, yes. Um, you're going to give us a second reading, if that's okay. Um, page 116, I a lot of us have different um, versions of the book. I think in the U.S. version, it's page 116. Do you want to go ahead? Because I think it explains that. Okay. 116? Yeah. Uh, I think in, uh, in my book, that's the U.S. version, it's 113. Okay. Is it the same? Let me have a look. It was 116, so hopefully it's 113. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's 113 all the way to 117, right? Should we just read the first two pages just to get an indication? Okay. Okay. Running. Uh, I thought I had time. When I arrived home for, the, for my next school break, though my uncle told Soila and me to walk with him, to our grandfather's house. He rarely paid attention to us, so I knew something was happening. I grabbed Soila's hand and held it tightly. It is time for these girls to get a cut, my uncle said to my grandfather. When I heard those words, I remembered the morning my mother had taken me to see the cut and clearly as if it had just happened. I pictured myself in the center of that uh, semicircle, the women around me holding me down, choking back my screams until I was alone. Enduring the pain every woman in our community had suffered for hundreds of years, I knew suddenly, clearly, that my teacher was right. As soon as the scars healed, my uncle would marry me off. I was still only eight, just about to turn nine not nearly old enough to get married. The man might be 30 or even older. There would be no more boarding school, certainly no college. The same would have happened to Soila. We would not be able to watch out uh, each other. We will not be able to be considered a part of each other's families. On uh, One half sister had already been married off. The other one had followed her boyfriend to another part of the, community, of the country. We were the only sisters left. This was it. This was the end of my parents' dream and mine. My belly ached at the, uh, and at the thought of being with an old man. I knew men and women did something together in secret, 
something men liked and women did not. Would my husband expect that of me? Will there be a first wife who resented me? Will the man would the man hit me? I would have I would have to cook and clean and follow these orders, his orders, sorry. There will be no time for me laughing and playing. My grandfather hesitated. Are you sure? He said to my uncle. I was tall. As tall as many girls who get the cut at 12 or 13. But I was so young. When my grandfather uh, looked at me, he saw a skinny little girl who still cried in the night over the death of her parents. My uncle saw another mouth to feed. We will need meat for the celebration, he said. We have to pay the woman for the cutting. It is the best to it is best to do all these uh, for these girls at once. He had three daughters. One ceremony for the five of us would be less expensive. And as I found out much later, he saw profit in Soila and me was planning to claim our dowries. My grandfather nodded. It was decided. Two days later, at my uncle's house, our elder clothes were waiting for us. The they were beautiful, a bright red top and a blue skirt, no hand made, uh, no hand me downs. I loved the, the thought of dressing in a grown up woman's clothing. Then I saw the razor, my mouth grew dry when I looked at the sharp blade. My cousins did not show any fear. They seemed excited. They were, uh, they were older than Soil and me. They are ready to become women. I also think they were ready to escape from my uncle's house. He bet them and the beating were worse than those I had endured from my grandfather's wife. Once he had beat, once he beat one of his granddaughters so badly, she coughed blood. They wanted to escape that house, even if it is meant for the cat. The only one I would talk to was Soila my sister, and I stayed up late into the night, whispering, I am afraid, I said, Soila would suffer the cut by my side, but that was not a comfort. When our parents died, Soila held my hand and hugged me through the, uh, through the worst night. She made sure I ate, I kept my hair neat, and I encouraged me to go to school. She was the only a child of herself, but she saved me. She was like my mother and my best friend. If she got the cut by my side, I only meant I was going to lose her. All girls get the cut, nice, she said, but her voice was shaking as much as mine. I do not want to marry an old man. I said, maybe he will be nice. He is going to touch you. I told her, he might beat you. He is going to give you a baby. I will have a home. We will have to work all the time. I will have a family. We are a family. We do not have a choice. We can run. My sister was silent for a long time. She was probably too old. I realize now to believe in my childish fantasy of escape. But she could see the importance of this uh, to me. And she was terrified. Our mother had taken her to see a girl who had gone through the cut too. Okay, thank you. So eventually um, you escaped, Soila was cut. Um, and then you said that you had this conversation with your, with your grandfather. I, I love the fact that he used to call you Twiga, which means giraffe because you were so tall. <laughs> and also that when you were born, born you were called Karembo, which means beautiful. I love that um, nickname. <laughs> so tell us, um, you go to speak to your grandfather, A, that must have taken a lot of courage to go and have this conversation with him. What did you say to him? How did you feel? And what was his reaction to that? Ah, uh, yeah, yes. My grandfather calls me Triga and uh, it's because I was tall and slim when I was young. So every time he was like, yeah, you, you need to eat and 
yeah and i think the the name trigger came out of that because you will see me as in trigger is giraffe in in, in english and uh, so uh, i think our relationship even now with my grandfather is really quite a strong one because i will say he's one of people of the people who has been supporting me throughout my journey and i know as a young girl uh, you know that time when i was supposed to undergo the cut it's not easy because remember he's an elderly person he's an elder in that community and you know elders most of them because they are elderly people they are the people who hold into culture more that the people we expect uh, who would say yes fgm in our community is important because of one two three reasons and i remember the first time i started having conversations after running away you know i was still telling my grandfather i don't want to die i don't want to become a mother i don't want to leave school i don't want you know to become someone's wife and that's why i don't want to undergo the cut but morely i was also trying to convince him that i want to stay more in school but i think even before that he agreed to support me remember i kept on <clears throat> pushing my circumcision time forward and the first time i told my grandfather you know i'm young i don't want to shame you i don't want to shame my family because i feel like now i'm not ready i will i will you know i will cry because you know it's a painful process and you know there are things like crying that you're not expected to to do so i told him give me more time because i don't want to shame also my family because and you know it was just a way of bargaining so that i have more time in school as i think of other ways i remember the second and third time i started also telling my grandfather just give me time you know next year or you know the other term i will be ready so until one time i think they sat me down and they said you know because my uncle came again they said you know now it's high time and that's why now i agreed to sit down with my grandfather and remember i had also escaped at home for some time i went and stayed with my teacher uh, you know teacher caroline and i say she is also one of the people who say she's very she has been very important in my journey because where is, where out, is she from uh teacher caroline is from lotoktok where i come from she was my teacher she was my swahili teacher uh yeah swahili yes teacher and uh you know i trusted that because uh, 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 because one uh it i could hear anything about fgm i would go and ask her is it true and also for her she was from a community where by fgm is not practiced so she will tell me even me i'm um, here i was able to go to school because of one two three reasons so focus on that Uh, so after i ran away for the second time remember i went and stayed with her and i stayed for long without going to school until now at some point because school is not my home i had to go to my grandfather and i told my grandfather you know all the stories all the things i've heard about fgm and i said that's why i don't want and i remember at some point i told him i will run away and even become a street child and i will never come back like fgm i don't want to undergo it so it got to a point that i was not asking for more time to stay in school but i just said you know it's something i don't want and i think at some point that's when my grandfather realized i think she's serious she might run away get lost in nairobi or become you know get lost in the streets so let's just give her time and the first time he said maybe if we give her time when she grows a little bit maybe at the age of 13 maybe she will think differently about it and she will agree so uh and you know we make even jokes about it uh, because i i remember the, when we were interviewing him for the book he asked me in our local language are you still coming back for it i was like <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed about it i know it's not like something he felt like i should have agreed because i would say he's one of the people who is also very proud of the work that i do and and he supports me in everything anytime you know we are together in forums with him because you know he's also like a community leader there he you know he attends different functions and sometimes we are together so he's one of the people who talks about fgm and convince the families and the community to take their kids to school and you know and you know protect them from fga and he will talk about me sometimes so it's something we talk about it each and every time and uh, i was like yeah you you still wait you know wait for me problem <laughs> <You> coming <wait. laughs> so yeah. how did you, how did you then finish your education and then translate this into something that you're really focusing your life on and um how how did amref come into this and how you you i mean you stopped 
FGM being practiced in your community, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so how I started in my community, because uh, they say charity begins at home. So I said also be, before I go to any other place, let me first try and help the girls of the place I come from. And it was easier because it's a community I know. But also remember, it's a community that was not accepted because one, I had not undergone circumcision. You know, I was given all names they give uncircumcised women. I was can not I, seen as a I, good. What, what kind of things do they, do they call uncircumcised women? There is a name they give to uncircumcised women. It's called Ndapai. I don't know how it's that in my local language. I don't know how to put it in English, but it's a, a name that doesn't sound really good in our local language. I don't know how to put it. Mm. And they will call you that even when you are passing. You know, they will look at you. They'll give you all the names. You, you know, even growing up there, playing with girls or, you know, children of my age, it was not easy because I, I was seen as a bad example. They were like, if you walk with her, if you stay with her, you know, they will tell you to stop, you know, because to them, not agreeing to undergo circumcision is not respecting your parents. Because they believe like girls or younger girls or younger children should really respect what the elderly people are saying. And uh, I said, my home will not be safe for me if I'm the only girl who has undergone FGM. What if we have a hundred girls like me, or 200 or 1,000 girls like me, will they be able to laugh at all of us? And I said, no. So what I decided to do now is to now, even when I was in high school, to start talking to girls in my own village. And as I said earlier, I was helping them to escape because I didn't know how to go about it. And when I was doing that, I was again fighting with the family. So at least I was able to save a few others I couldn't. And I think throughout now my time, uh, you know, after high school, when you have a period of time, when I went to college, you know, I was still working with my community, trying to talk to them. And I think that's when I also uh, met with Amref when I was uh, about 16, 17, if I remember well. And uh, they came to my community and they said they need a girl and a boy who has been to school. So in that community, it was the the first time they come to a community, their entry point is cultural leaders because they are the ones who gives an okay. Like now you can come to this village, you can work, you can come with whatever project that you want. You have to get blessings from them. So they had many boys who, are, who have been to school because education is for boys in that community. But I was the only girl who has been to school. The and only was, girl? Yeah, in my village, not, not in Kenya, just to be clear where yeah, I come from. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, at that time, I wouldn't say I was the best option, but they didn't have an option. And that's how I got selected to go to that training. So when I went to that training, I was trained on peer education, you know, like a community teacher. And I was taken throughout a training for a week on issues of sexual and productive and rights issues, <clears throat> issues of FGM and its effects, child marriage and all that. Because before I knew the things that, that has happened in the community, but uh, you know, I didn't understand more about the issue. And I think out of that training, now I got ideas on how I can have a dialogue with the community. I got you know, skills, you know, I was more equipped with knowledge and I could talk about it. So when we went after the training, we were told to go and you know, form youth groups you know, or other groups and you know, talk to our people and you know, raise the issue on FGM. Because I think one thing they believed in is that change has to start from the inside out. Because morally, uh, it's easy for people from that place because it's a culture they understand. They understand the things they are supposed to say and not to say. It's always easier to just empower them and let them go, you know, address whatever problem that is facing that community. And um, <clears throat> after the training is when now I decided I cannot be fighting again with them. I need to start a dialogue. And that's why I started talking to cultural leaders. It was not easy because I was a woman, I was not allowed to talk in front of men. It took me more than one and a half years to be accepted because I'm a woman. But as I always like staying, working in that community for more than 10 years now, there are things I learned. When you are trying to make change, you can do it overnight. You don't expect change in two days. You really have to be patient, patience, patience. So I knew that is very important when I'm trying to address that. And also remember, as, as I always like saying, issues of female genital mutilation, it's about changing mindset and attitude. 
and uh, again but using centuries force. old, centuries old mindset yeah. that passed yeah. down through generations. Yeah. How how do you go about changing that? Yeah, so one of it, as I said, is patience. You go today, they reject you. They say, we don't want to hear. We want to talk about malaria or anything else they want. You really also have to go with, uh, with, uh, with the pace that you see because you have to ensure that you have gotten to a point that you know, there is dialogue, there is room for dialogue. You can now have a conversation. And I think that's, I, you know, sometimes when I look at televisions, I look at things that are going worldwide, I see other things and I'm like, sometimes you just need to talk. We don't have to fight. We don't have to say we are taking you to jail. Yeah, I know we have the act against FGM. I'm not saying for people who break law, uh, you know, will not be taken to jail or they are not fined against that. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm, I've just seen the importance of people having dialogue, just talking to each other. Because uh, I think I'm from a community whereby we believe in solving things by just talking. And the other thing, uh, you know, apart from dialogue and patience is all that, is just to talk less and give people time to talk more because you can't know everything. They'll give you a hundred reasons on why they think FGM is important and it's good to girls and women. You'll have to listen to all. And I'll tell them it's, there's no wrong and right answer. That is what people used to believe in. But now we are at a point we are saying it's wrong because it's not allowing girls to be the women we want them to be. It's taking them out of school. We also understand when they give birth and they are still children, there are also other health consequences. They are married and they are young. They also have the health consequences around it. So it's to listen to whatever they want to tell you, but now take them a step at a time. Because also you can always learn something from them. You can't know everything. And the other thing uh, is also not to be not to judge them and also treat them with lots of love. As I said, they are not doing it because they hate their daughters. I keep on saying that. It's because that is the culture they know. That is the practice they understand. And they are also doing it out of love to protect their daughters. So it's just to say it had a meaning those days. And now we are saying it's wrong again because of one, two, three, ten reasons. And I think once you show them love and not judge them because of that practice, that is how they have been able to give us an eye. And that is how we've been able to work, you know, as AMREF with different communities in Kenya and Tanzania. And through the alternative rights of passage again, by talking, by structured dialogue, by sitting down with elderly people, you know, you know, mothers, empowering girls to also know their rights. And to know and to also know how to say no because it's their body they they they, they need uh, you know it's their body and you know they also have to understand that they can say no to it and uh, we have to make them understand that why is it important to be in school but they can say no by telling their parents it's wrong because of one two three the reason I don't want to undergo it because this is what I'll have to face in future or even now and I think by talking to all these communities uh, with patience and all that that I've been talking about but also understanding each other and love we've been able to to save over 20,000 girls and women and I'm not saying we've ended it because remember uh, every year over three million girls and they're still at risk of undergoing female genital mutilation. So I, I do, uh, you know, it, we have not ended it, but I, I like saying the 20,000 is a generation that we have already changed. They are daughters, they, you know, they are great grandchildren or grandchildren or people around them. You know, they are, they are, you know, they are safe. We know that. Look at those community members, because if I talk of those numbers, it's not only nice or armor if we have been able to do that. It's because of the cultural leaders, the women and men from this community who had agreed to, you know, make change and also support their girls in education. So it, it's, it's achievement, it's small, but we like, we, we like appreciating it because it, it starts somewhere, it's always, yeah. So I think by joining AMREF, being empowered and not only me, I think they have been able to empower many other champions who are doing, uh, you know, amazing work on the fight against FGM northern part of Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Senegal, in Tanzania. We have people like me who are already trying to make a difference in their community. Yeah. And I think that is that is the way to go. Once you empower I, local community members, they are able to, yeah. Sorry. I, I um, you know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine about 
this and our conversation today and we, she was looking at the stats and it was just quite extraordinary how widespread FGM is. It's just, it's unbelievable actually, when you look at how many women are mutilated in this way. Um, we've got a lot of questions. We've only got eight minutes to get through them. So um, I'm just gonna go through them quickly. And if you could just um, be quite brief in how you um, reply. Um, Mark has asked, has the international campaign against FGM made a difference um, within the Maasai community? Yeah, um, the international campaign, yes, I will say uh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, it has helped in a big way because as I said, it's a global issue now. It's not a Kenyan issue. We might, uh, and I think also the international campaigns also help us in, you know, you know, you know, global leaders and also, you know, other leaders in different countries also try and, you know, put, uh, uh, you know, put put also some seriousness on the issue. And I think also the whole point of getting out the book and other things is also to make sure that people understand it's still an issue up to now. We still have girls who are dying because of FGM. They are missing school because of FGM. They are being married because of FGM. And I think, uh, you know, all those international networks, and I think also now we have like, you know, network or movements to end FGM globally. And whenever we have important meetings, either like, um, you know, what are they called? Uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to remember the global event, but I can't remember them well. But normally, and I know Amrith is part of it, and you know other like-minded organization, they always have like a side event in these great meetings or international meetings that are going on. And I think at that time, you have partners from different organizations who are working on the issue. They think together, sometimes they plan together. And you know, even raising awareness on social media and other networks, because we have also seen the power of you know social media and other means. And you know, now we can see people in televisions and other places, they are talking about the issue. And I think the local community cannot end FGM on its own because our, our vision or our goal is to bring FGM to an end by 2030. So unless also global leaders talk about it, also unless we do international campaigns, unless we include everyone and 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 uh, involve everyone in the journey, that's the only way we are able to achieve to achieve that. So I think they have yeah they have made an important um, they have made an important addition to the work that we are doing because if you look at you know. All those global events, most of them, you'll have young people or different people from grass uh, communities who are talking about the issue they're addressing. Yeah, um, obviously it's such a difficult time at the moment because we're just, we're still in the pandemic, you know. Vaccination rates are still very low um, across huge parts of the world. So we're very much still in the pandemic. In terms of what, the pandemic and how it has played out has meant for FGM. What kind of an impact do you think that has had? I'll say, and I'll try to, because of time to bring in, be brief, and I will say uh, it has really been big because an example is Kenya. Schools were closed for almost one year. And you know, school is a safe home for girls. If it's school, we know at least they can afford three meals a day. We know they are protected from harmful practices like FGM or child marriage, you know, or teenage pregnancies or any other form of violences. And I think uh, since COVID, we have seen the rise on different forms of gender-based violence. And I don't know when we are going to be able to recover because the impact has really been big. So we are now also trying to change our model of working because you can't have public forums. You can have the community dialogue we used to have, but we are also coming with other ways like using, you know, AMREF as an organization, look, using local radio station, you know, mounting sometimes even public address in our cars during market days and we raise awareness on it because you also have to raise awareness on the issue that is affecting women and girls, but also on the COVID, uh, you know, and also raising awareness, making sure they understand COVID is there. They need to take vaccines. They need, you know, you know the, all the other protocols that people need to observe when they're undergoing. So yeah, the impact has been quite big, but we are trying to see what we can. We can do. Um, now, this is two questions in one, Elish, and I, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. She is asking about your Leadership Academy, a nice place, um, and asking if you could just talk us through the work that you're going to do. It's opening next month, I understand. 
And also there's another question, which I think um, plays in nicely to this is, what advice would you give to other young people who want to make a positive change in their community? Mm. So one, a nice place is a leadership academy and a safe home for girls, the girls who are still at risk and running away from FGM or child marriage. So we believe now they'll have a safe home as we reconcile them back with their families to stay as they continue with their education. But also on the same time, we want to start equipping girls with leadership skills, advocacy skills, entrepreneurial skills at, the, at that center. So we'd be having 50 girls for the leadership academy and uh, undergoing the whole training which will be like a nine months training and also for the rescue we'll be having about 50 girls so uh, I like talking about it because it's a dream project that I'm seeing coming true and we're opening it next month on the 11th of October that's the day of the girl child and that's when we felt like there's no any other important day to really open the center officially like that day so I'm happy because now we know you know our girls we will we'll have a, a home we can you know uh, we can say they are safe, they, they can talk. Uh, where is where it? By there. It's back in my village. It's uh, where I come from, southern part of Kenya. And it's built in a land that I was given by my father, my late father. So yeah, that's where the center is. We donated it for that, yeah. No, that must be extraordinary to go back and open a leadership academy there after everything you've done and to come back and provide a safe space for girls. So, so what do yeah. you think? What can young people, what's your advice to young people who want to make a change in, in their community? Uh, one, I like telling uh, young people, you know, all of us, we can always make a difference in the respective communities we are coming from. And I always tell people, you don't need to wait until you have an office or, you know, it can start under a tree. You can start anywhere. So wherever you are, you don't have to wait. Always think of what is affecting your society or a globe or you know a nation and all that and just try and make a difference because sometimes we think because we are young maybe we can't but I think we have all it takes to to make change and to make a difference so this is a great nation you know it's a great globe that uh, people who have been there before us has taken care of uh, you know they have tried to build it the way it was to make the world a better place and I think uh, we are the people who now can take after them. And until we up our game and do what we are supposed to do and make a difference, that's the only way. So that's for young people. What about, you know, people are watching from all over the globe. And it's, it's interesting when you hear just how horrific this process is and what these girls are put through. Um, it can not, you, you just feel so disempowered in actually making a change. So how can you, how can, let's say me sitting here in London, how could I make a difference? And how could I join the fight to end FGM? Um, one, I like saying by talking about it and raising awareness, the next neighbor or the other person next to you, or it can be through social media and all that. I think that is always important just to talk about it so that people can understand that it's an issue that is still affecting girls and women. And I think also the other thing, uh, as I said, we have so many champions like me and others who are now in their communities, you know, making a difference. And I think also by supporting Amref UK, they are able to really uh, continue really spreading the FGM work in different, in different countries, because now we are in four countries, we are not in all countries where, you know, FGM is an issue. And I think by any support, by talking about it and all that, we can always expand our work, we can always continue uh, really empowering more communities to be able to make change. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the hour, um, nice, but, you know, some of the comments, I just wanted to, to share them with you. People saying you've done so much, you're really an inspiration, you know, thank you so much for a beautiful book and for sharing your story. Your work is amazing. These are just some of the things that people um, have been putting up. I just want to say thank you so much um, for sharing your story, for being so brave. This is nice as wonderful book you can get it online um and i look forward to coming a to visiting yeah. you yeah thank you Kimberly. just a second before i forget i know my senior editor here ella and team are here i really must say thank you thank you for helping me putting the story in our uk office rachel camilla and everyone and kate thank you thank you really for making this one happen thank you
And to you, Kimberly, thank you also. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing you it's in Kenya. My pleasure. I, I look forward to seeing you and I look forward to visiting your um your leadership academy and meeting the thank girl. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I just thank want to you. say get vaccinated. That's what everyone should do. <laughs> Absolutely, I've got to. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need a booster now, but I have yeah. to. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone.